Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. The three-day India Energy Week was the first major event under India's G20 presidency. The aim was to create strategies to deliver a multifaceted energy system and making energy accessible, among others. Speaking to me at the summit, Sandeep Kashyap, COO at the ACME Group, sees green hydrogen and ammonia receiving higher investments. He also believes that India has the capability to run green plants on a 24 by 7 basis. Mr. Kashyap, thank you so much for uh, talking to us at CNBC TV 18. And clearly, you're one person who is almost in all verticals when you look at renewables. We do want to know on what geographies do you think the penetration has been easier? What states have been more receptive? And where do you see a higher footprint going forward? So, in fact, um, as you rightly said, we are in solar. We are one of the largest solar players in the country today with a portfolio of 4.8 gigawatt. We have recently ventured into wind. Uh, we are also developing pumped hydro solar projects and we have entered into the battery storage as well. The major reason of entering into all these verticals is primarily because today we believe the discoms are not really looking at pure vanilla solar or wind power. They are looking at hybrid, more dispatchable or RERTC power and therefore we are working on all these solutions. And uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the receptivity, I would say uh, the whole program is run through uh, RPO obligations. However, from the generation point of view, you, you would have seen uh, in the last three to four years time, most of the development which has happened primarily in the uh, state of Rajasthan uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, you can generate electricity uh, at the lowest cost over there and you can actually uh, supply that electricity to DISCOMS through ISTS network which is the national grid through PGSL substation. SECI has been playing a major role in this and they, have, they are one of the largest aggregators as a government agency today and feeding power. Uh, to various discoms and states. So uh, I believe at this stage, every state is willing to take and wanting to take uh, more and more renewable power by virtue of, uh, because of the fact that renewable power is much cheaper than any other form of the power, uh, by making it more dispatchable and uh, uh, stable in terms of uh, RTC, uh, I believe it is going to be a great time going forward. Okay. And what is also your visibility on the investment part of it and how are you looking at fundings? There's a lot of conversation on investments coming in via collaborations also. What's your sense? So, for the renewable business, I believe uh, it's a very uh, established funding mechanism which is already in place. Uh, we have agencies like PFC, REC, AREDA. Generally, these are the government agencies which are funding the initial projects. And most of the times we see uh, private banks or commercial banks come into play when the project is operational and running. And they, we, as the developers, we go and generally refinance the projects at that time because normally these banks do not want to take the project exhibition risk. In terms of green hydrogen and green ammonia, which is the, uh, which is the new area, I believe uh, where the investments again are going to be much larger compared to a typical uh, solar or a wind project. Uh, all these agencies are working on uh, uh, setting up the policies and the structure for funding of such projects. And I believe um, in these areas where we have technologies like electrolyzers, which will play a bigger role. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we will have international off-taker agreements coming into play. We will see a lot of foreign investment coming into in India, both in terms of manufacturing, especially when make in India manufacturing, uh, there is a lot of focus from the government of India and on every front, if you see on renewable, be it electrolyzers or uh, solar manufacturing, which is modules. At the same time, we see green hydrogen, green ammonia. Uh, government of India is running PLI schemes. And uh, as a country, I would say we are one of those few countries where government has put money on the table and inviting uh, companies and uh, uh, to come on and uh, start manufacturing in India, including the Indian companies. Okay. I have a two-part question. One, what sectors are you targeting when you are, uh, uh, you know, making this energy? And two is, uh, yes, there are a lot of verticals and there's a lot of push from the government and help as well. But there, how would you look at the cost competitiveness within the sector? So from, uh, if you see the renewable part of the story, we are almost one of the most uh, competitive countries in the world, except uh, Middle East, which is slightly better in terms of solar irradiance. Uh, and therefore, the cost over there is slightly lesser, which we see. We ourselves are developing plants outside the country as well, which is Oman, where we have 30% more solar radiance. But however, having said so, we also have certain advantages which we have in the country. As a country, we have a very large grid, national grid, which gives us an opportunity to bank power and run 
our plants which is uh, for green hydrogen and green ammonia almost 24/7 by banking which is not uh, available in any of the countries in the world so if we really see we become almost equally competitive compared to uh, middle east countries uh, and uh, the gap which we see to be export competitive with our product uh, we have been giving inputs to government of india and niti aayog and uh, ministry of new and renewable energy and they have been kind enough to understand it and uh, making it a part of the incentive schemes on exports or even for the indian uh, consumption uh, in the new policy which is recently come out for green hydrogen and green ammonia with this we believe to a large extent we will be able to uh, you know produce green hydrogen and green ammonia at a price which is competitive elsewhere in the world and this gives us an opportunity to really become a export hub for the country all right mr kashyap thank you so much for taking time on talking to us Please thank you so much thank you. pleasure is mine at the india energy week pm narendra modi launched the solar cooktop a product that has been designed by indian oil and pm modi placed a strong mandate on bringing solar cooktops to 3 crore indian households in the next few years i spoke to abhishek kar who is senior program lead at the council on energy environment and water on the green push i think what is happening here is the pm's announcement is a clear signal that india is trying to push towards a clean stack of fuels currently after the remarkable success of the pradhan mantri ujjwala yojana the pmui program where we we reached up to 9 crore women but we know that there is a people are using a mix of firewood and lpg and if you have to stack and if stacking is inevitable we rather stack with the cleaner fuels like solar and lpg rather than you know firewood so uh, it's a it's a great and it's a very ambitious thing frankly because they have started from 50 household pilot to they are going for 3 crore but i do believe you know because the government has done it for 9 crore households in few years time which was a remarkable in terms of scale so the the government is ambitious they are thinking of of really pushing it through i think some of the key issues that will that will be very important when we do this kind of roll out is what is the target audience and if the target audience is the rural poor like it was for pmui program then there will be questions around financing because of course the cost of a solar and i i'm sure you have seen the stove with a pretty large panel it is going to be significant people will not be able to bear it so will there be bank will be able to give microfinance and the good thing with this is that the government has got the basis covered in terms of the basic infrastructure people have access to bank accounts it's linked to other so if the government plans to give out loans it can be pretty quickly scaled up so in terms of the elements of scalability are there but what is going to happen is there will be significant need for private investment unless the government wants to do it completely by the the indian oil or the other other two mcs can also join in in case of solar it will be like starting from the scratch it's difficult but i'm really hopeful this is going to be a great success you know i was reading a report from you which suggested that nearly 70% households were using lpg and this is for 2021 interestingly you also talked about carbon credits on lpg how is that going to work and uh, I, i mean do you how do you look at the feasibility of it all right you know so carbon to whenever we talk about lpg as a fossil fuel and carbon free we're like wow really but the thing is that research after research has shown in recent years that most of the firewood that is being used is being unsustainably harvested if firewood is being sustainably harvested there is no net carbon additions but if it is unsustainably harvested whatever the portion that is unsustainable you are adding to it so if you are transitioning and and we are like about to kind of release a policy brief with csr and edi stockholm environmental institute and others is that if if globally you completely transition from firewood whatever the sustainability levels are to lpg it actually has net gains for the climate so you know so there is data and numbers which kind of prove something that is that seems very counterintuitive at first mm. abhishek you know with the kind of world we are in and so many announcements and new launches coming in from the ministry of petroleum and pm itself how do you envision 2023 now there's talk about fossil fuels and gas and hydrogen renewables ev i mean there is there's, there's a huge energy future that the street is talking about right you know and and that is where i think india is on the cusp of a energy transformation there on one hand we will have some short term dependence on fossil fuels 
That's what the PM today talked about exploration of fossil fuels. On the other hand, we're also talking about net zero and we're talking about solar stove. You know, so I think, I think it kind of reflects the reality of our immediate near term needs and our medium and long term ambitions. And where do you see the major investments going in? I think, let me speak about the clean cooking space particularly. I think there is significant amount of space if you are, because in India, if you think of there are just out of 25 crore households, uh, say there will be around 15, 16 crore who can afford LPG and electric induction smooth. But for the other, especially which we so called call the bottom of the pyramid, there are nine crore PMUI beneficiaries. We have to reach out to them. And there is a significant need of investments in both R&D to reduce the cost as well as to give better after-sales service. Because you have to understand, biomass stove is free of cost and behaviorally is very, very difficult to make people switch to a new one. If the new technology is there and it's not working for any reason, the cost of switchback is very minimal. They can just build a, rebuild the chula in a few days, in a few hours time. That is the reason, you know, it's very important that when you are trying to scale up clean cooking, we actually focus on not just making the product a kind of robust one, but also the after sales service and the entire infrastructure, market infrastructure. With that, it's time for a short break, but don't go anywhere. We bring to you more from the India Energy Week and renewables industry. Welcome back, you're watching Commodity Champions and India's green energy transition got a big push at the India Energy Week with over 650 companies exhibiting in the summit. I caught up with Saurabh Singh of Kearney. Here's what he has to say about green financing, current ecosystem and more. Saurabh, thank you so much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 and so much is being talked about digitization, digital, energy transition, etc. What's your take first of all on all of this from India Energy Week? No, thank you, Manisha, first for having me here. Uh, just great to be speaking to you right now. Uh, the way I look at it, I mean, if I were to look at the energy world, I see five disruptive themes that are going to change the, the way we are looking at this sector. The first is the transition from molecules to electrons, basically the rise of electrification. Uh, the second big theme that I see is the advent of technology. It is all kinds of technology, not just digital, but even, even other disruptive technology within each of these sectors. The third thing that I'm looking at is convergence. It is the convergence of the energy value chain. You have oil and gas players getting into, uh, you know, the, the electricity business and, and vice versa as well. So it's a very, very interesting play. Uh, and, and, and the fourth thing is the rise of green financing, which I think could be a game changer, uh, you know, in, in, in the overall sector. And, and last but not the least, I, I see a big, big shift in the positions that various players are taking across the value chain. So overall, a very, very interesting uh, Set, set of dynamics that are happening there. And in my mind, energy sector, which if I may use that word, was considered staid and boring 15 years ago. Uh, there was a lot of question around young talent talking about, should I even be in this sector? You know, it's, it, it, is it for me? Right now, you have young talent queuing up, literally queuing up and saying, I want to work in this sector because this is where we are really changing the world. If you're talking about the millenn millennials and the Gen, Gen Zs, they are the ones who are talking about being part of hydrogen, being part of CCUs, being part of the overall decarbonization story and believing that they're making a difference to the planet. Oh, so, absolutely. I think sort of when you talk about solar and EVs and nitrogen and hydrogen and, uh, you know, various launches that we've seen, especially happen during and collaborations in IEW clearly have a lot of push happen here. How do you look, look at all of that taking off uh, all at the same time? Or do you think there is going to be a one, two, three within this space as well? Got it. So let me just give you a few data points, which, which I think will, will corroborate what I've said, right? So like a couple of years ago, 75% of the incremental cap renew, cap power capacity globally was renewables. Come to think of it, that is phenomenal. I mean, a watershed moment in Europe was when for the first time, I think it was in 2020, they sold more renewable energy in unit terms than they sold thermal, 38% as against 37%. I mean, some of these things are basically showing that there's a change that's happening. Is everything happening at the same time? The answer is no. Of course, I think there are some, some trends which are more here and now. And there's also a bit of a geographical uh, implication of it, right? So, for example, Europe obviously is way ahead in some matters. Uh, a geography like India, 
the dynamics are different for us the requirements are different and we are you know kind of kind of catching up but the market is also rewarding those players i think uh, uh, last year or so the renewable energy shares went up by 142% while the oil and gas shares went down by 38% now that is the kind of difference that's coming in so if you ask me the push on renewable energy that is here and now that's happening even as we speak the push that's happening in india right 500 billion dollars odd investment over this decade is phenomenal and a lot of it is very very real there are similarly ev i would say uh, is again a, a phenomena which is catching up will it happen overnight we don't think so but i think by 2040 our expectation is that more than 50% of the vehicles sold will be ev uh, by by then and then there is of course hydrogen the big thing that everybody seems to be talking about and incidentally we are behind some of the largest hydrogen related work that's happening in india working with some of the best and brightest and some of the largest announcements that have been made are there going to be a lot of infrastructure changes as well then as we talk about newer energies uh so yes i mean there is an ecosystem that has to be developed around these if you want to make it successful so be it the development of cryogenics for example as you want to move things around be it the the entire uh, ecosystem for developing uh, electrolyzers i mean the number of people who are contemplating that right now uh, in a geography like india itself is not funny i mean there's a lot of interest in setting it up and i can tell you this is going to be big business Shapurji Palanji Oil and Gas have built one of the India's largest floating vessel for ONGC. The vessel is expected to reach the domestic waters before the end of December. At the India Energy Week, S Ravi Shankar, director and CEO of Shapurji Palanji Energy explained to me on how these vessels work and what is the opportunity for India. Most of the fields are operated on cost recovery basis. So the people are investing on the fields. and uh, they are recovering cost on uh, putting up the christmas trees or uh, subsea architecture drilling etc but what is happening is that we are coming in between when the fields are uh, fully ready for taking out the condensates we don't call it as an oil the condensates which is a combination of oil gas mercury sulfur carbon dioxide water everything is there and uh, it is not closer to the land to be evacuated and uh, the shore facilities could be done so we built these kinds of uh, floating uh, storage and offloading system so we take those condensates uh, through a turret mooring system a turret mooring system is the one which is weather vaning this fpso will be stationed in the same place for any number of years 15 20 years and whereas it will revolve around that place so that with the weather waves and other things it takes care of it so we take the water out first we purify the water add certain chemicals inject them back into the wells to get more power for the wells to lift oil what is the cost of doing this i mean uh, for prepare for making something like this to cost of production or processing as you might call it what is the break even like okay it's simple thing is that these are all built to the specification of that particular field the condensates which are coming out from field to field are different so if i am making one fpso it cannot be used in another fpso because the field is different the heat is different the flow assurance difference the characteristics are different the mid ocean conditions are different wave heights are different so some of them cost us somewhere about uh, 400 million dollars it goes up to 3 billion dollars uh, the cost of uh, making one so normally we give these vessels for a long term charter for a period of between 9 years to 10 years and it is extendable up to 20 25 years it can do that so we work on a fixed day rate so the cost of production is not for us it's for the oil uh, field operators which comes to that but there has it's a significant portion of that is paid to us as a charter hire and how uh, uh, what kind of a market do you see for this going forward we foresee between now and uh, the next 10 years at least about 40 to 50 fpso's aggregating totally about uh, let's say about uh, 100 to 150 billion dollars worth of contracts to be coming out in the market only for the asset is concerned the potential of largest number of engineers in fact all these projects we have built with an indian engineers indian construction team indian commissioning nobody has done it and we are the only company in india to do this along with the fixed platforms together the fixed platforms in the group and the floating 
In the Western offshore, we process almost about 26% of the content sales which is produced. Globally, it sets an opportunity with a share investment of about a billion dollar in some of the shipyards. India can export per year seven to ten billion dollars worth of these things every year. If you see that the opportunity what we are creating to the Indian industry is enormous what we are given. Amid the intense volatility in the crude oil market impacted by geopolitical tensions, Vandana Hari of Vanda Insight doesn't see crude prices heading towards $100 per barrel. Speaking to me at the India Energy Week, she also said that Chinese demand will not return swiftly. So, uh, 2022 was, an year, was a year of uncertainties, 2023 no less. The nature of uncertainties have changed. Uh, so 2022 first part um, we started off with the world coming out of covid and then of course once the ukraine war started that completely changed the dynamics i think 2023 the main theme is going to be the global economic growth obviously and we are already seeing oil prices respond very directly to the sentiment in the markets and then to some extent uh, opec opec plus have taken a back seat they are in a wait and watch mode the oil markets are also in a wait and watch mode with regard to China. So yes, China is opening. I think it's a no brainer that their demand will come back. But does it come roaring back or does it come back gradually? I think uh, we, we still don't know. You know, I want to uh, take the major question out of the way before we move any further. And that's about the crude oil prices, because that is something everybody seems to be debating on. Are we looking at tighter markets as we go ahead? Are we looking at 100 coming back? What's your sense? So um, I'm not in that camp of uh, Uber bulls calling for $100 a barrel. And the reason for that is that I do not expect Chinese demand to come back, uh, bounding back so fast that it takes uh, everybody by surprise, uh, especially OPEC Plus. And the other reason is that OPEC Plus does have some spare capacity. Uh, they reduced their target by 2 million barrels per day. Actual supply reduction is, of course, much less. It's closer to <clears throat> about 500,000 barrels per day. But they could put that, that amount of oil back into the market. I think we'll also see uh, some sort of um, pr price, elastic price elasticity uh, in terms of demand. So global economy is not going to do as well this year. So we will see a little bit of uh, drop in demand from other parts of the world, which will also offset uh, China's coming back. So I, 100 plus, of course, never say never, but uh, I hope not. And I don't think so. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Commodity Champions. News continues on CNBC TV 18. Do stay tuned.